Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Intimate Partner Human Trafficking, the Intersection of Domestic Violence and Sexual Exploitation. Today's program is presented by Equitas and presented by Jen Dolly and Wendy Barnes. My name is C. Ross, and I am an Administrative Associate at Equitas, and I will be moderating today's webinar. If you have a question during the presentation, please enter it in the question and answer box. We will answer questions periodically throughout the webinar. You are also welcome to contact us directly at any time following today's presentation, and we'll send you contact information during our follow-up. Next slide, please. Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. Next slide. As national training and technical assistance provider, Equitas develops resources, conducts trainings, and offers 24 seven consultations for prosecutors and allied professionals. For more information on Equitas, please visit our website at equitasresource.org. Next slide. You can also follow Equitas on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. The link to each is available on our website. Next slide. Today's presentation is for the Just Exits Initiative, supported by the Novo Foundation. The Just Exits Initiative is transforming justice by closing on ramps to and building off ramps from exploitation. We do this by educating prosecutors and law enforcement about how exploiters coerce, manipulate, brainwash, and force victims to engage in illegal activity supporting prosecutors in their efforts to identify wrongful arrests and charges and to remedy wrongful convictions of exploited persons, collaborating with communities to ensure that survivors can access services that offer meaningful life opportunities and measuring meaningful prosecution outcomes to ensure a just response. Next slide, please. Presenting our webinar today are Jen Dolly and Wendy Barnes. Jen Dolly is an attorney advisor at Equitas with a focus on human trafficking. Prior to joining Equitas, Jen was an assistant district attorney at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. During her 11 year career, she prosecuted violent felonies, including human trafficking, kidnapping, sexual assault, robbery, weapons possession, drug conspiracies, and intimate partner crimes. Jen was a co-founder of the Human Trafficking Response Unit at the Manhattan DA's office and served as its first ever deputy chief. Wendy Barnes is a Just Exits Advisory Council member and has been a human trafficking response program coordinator with Dignity Health since January, 2018. Since 2004, while working full-time in the corporate world, Wendy has volunteered her time to multiple, multiple nonprofit organizations, spreading awareness and sharing her powerful story of survival. I will now turn it over to Jen Dolly. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much, C, and thank you so much, Wendy, for being here today to present. Um, and thank all of you. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, we appreciate you being here to talk about intimate partner sex trafficking today. Um, our objectives today are to um, help you recognize and describe methods of control used by intimate partner traffickers. We are also going to help you identify and minimize, uh, well, identify some of those barriers to disclosing and exiting intimate partner violence, specifically intimate partner sex trafficking, and hopefully give you some um, ways to minimize those barriers and break through and, and really help people exit um, the violence that they are living in. Finally, we're going to help. Uh, we're going to give you some ideas on how to investigate and prosecute crimes of intimate partner human trafficking. So, just two brief caveats um, as we get started. Um, common experiences of the intersection of intimate partner violence and sex trafficking are not necessarily consistent with everyone's experience. We're very lucky um, to have Wendy Barnes here today to talk with us. But again, what we discuss today are just common experiences, but certainly not um, what everybody experiences. 
Um, and also human trafficking, as we all know, has many forms. Um, this presentation is going to focus on the intersection of intimate partner violence and sex trafficking, but obviously um, there's labor trafficking and um, victims of, of any gender, race, ethnicity, and age um, can be a, a victim of trafficking. And please reach out to Equitas. We have plenty of resources on um, different types of trafficking if you are interested. So um, today we're going to talk, uh, as I've said, about intimate partner sex trafficking. Um, and really today we want to talk about, I, I think many people are familiar at this point with the methods of power and control that offenders use in intimate partner or domestic violence cases. Um, and I, I think maybe people are a little bit less familiar with the tactics traffickers use um, of force, fraud, and coercion to force victims into the commercial sex industry. Um, and so today we're going to talk about um, how actually many of those methods of power and control that you're already familiar with are very similar to these methods of force, fraud, and coercion. We're hoping to give you kind of an overview of what these um, sex trafficking, intimate partner sex trafficking relationships look like how they um, are initiated, some of the factors that go into the vulnerabilities that traffickers um, play off of and really exploit, um, and then how that kind of manifests itself in your work today, whether you're a prosecutor, um, a law enforcement agent, um, working in service providers, or, or any, anywhere within the system, um, and how you can kind of take what we're going to hopefully convey to you today into the work you do and think about that as you move forward. So I think um, starting with the initiation of the relationship, it really begins as many other relationships do, whether it's an intimate partner violence, a uh, relationship of intimate partner violence, or a um, sex trafficking intimate partner relationship, they begin just as any, other, any others do, whether it's online in the plethora of ways that we know people are meeting each other online these days, um, or a more traditional method is in someone from your neighborhood, someone from your social circle or your church um, through a family member. And I think the key really is that these relationships look like any other as they begin. Um, I believe, you know, that's the case, right, Wendy? Yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Barnes and I am a survivor of sex trafficking. Um, I was trafficked for over a decade. Um, and so I do use my story to um, help educate others on what to look for. I know for me, I met my trafficker when I was 15 years old in high school. He was also going, he was also a student in high school. And traffickers, you know, and honestly, I can't say for sure that, I, I, that he was a trafficker at that time or if he became a trafficker, um, you know, during, while we were meeting. But I know that one thing about traffickers and what my trafficker did to me is they take the time to get to know you so that they know what tactics uh, are going to be best to, you know, to make you do things that you would not normally do. Um, I know for me, um, I, at 15 years old, I felt very lost, alone, and unloved. And he paid attention to me. He asked me questions that nobody had ever asked before. Just things like, hey, what do you like to do? What do you not like to do? Um, you know, just he was interested in me. And so for me, his promise was that we're going to live happily ever after. You know, that's all I ever wanted. I wanted to have this relationship. I wanted to have jobs, have children, and then grow old together. Um, I didn't feel that was too much to ask. So go ahead, next slide. You know, and sometimes traffickers will, you know, they, they use the vulnerabilities that victims already have, but also they will create scenarios where you are vulnerable. For me, Right after um, he, we, I got pregnant with his baby right after I met him. And there was a very long grooming period with him. It was about a year and a half total. So it was after I had our first child 
when she was about three months old, he convinced me that the only way that we were going to be able to have the have happily ever after was if I ran away from my mom's home, which she was completely supporting me. If I ran away from home and went into a domestic or yeah, a, a shelter in downtown Seattle. Once I was there, um, I, I ran out of diapers and formula. And I, Honestly, I believe that he knew this. And so when I went to him and said, hey, we don't have any more diapers. We don't have any more formula. What are we going to do? He was just like, well, all you have to do is walk out onto the street. A man will stop and pick you up. He's going to offer you money to have sex with them. You have sex with them right there in the car. And when you're done, you have money for her diapers and formula. I couldn't believe what he was saying. I was shocked. I was confused. I was like, what are you saying? I couldn't even fathom what he was suggesting that I do. But then he went off and well, don't you love our daughter? Well, yes, I love my daughter. And he says, well, if you were a good mother, you would be willing to do anything for her. So go ahead, Jen. So I think when we when we take a look, you know, Wendy's spoken very eloquently about these, these, we look at this hierarchy of needs, right? And these are needs that everyone has from, you know, the most basic needs of shelter and clothing and a place to, to you know, place to stay to personal safety needs, as in, you know, employment and being able to support yourself and, and keep yourself healthy to really this love and these kind of more um, overarching themes of wanting to be loved and to feel belonging. Um, that sense of family and that sense of friendship and intimacy, and then to feel good about yourself, right? To feel like you have self-esteem and to feel respect for yourself. And, you know, many times when these needs aren't met, that creates a vulnerability. And, and as Wendy said, traffickers are incredibly um, adept at exploiting um, vulnerabilities um, and creating then, uh, you know, an intimate partner, sex trafficking relationships, creating that intimate relationship where they know um, and get to know every single vulnerability you have, um, and then can really turn it into that coercion and that force and the methods in which that they get you to do what they want you to do. Um, one of uh, our other council members we work with talks about how her trafficker would brag about how he would find vulnerable young girls. He would go up to a young girl and say, hi, you're so beautiful. And if she engaged with him and interacted with him, he felt as though she had, you know, she had some self-esteem, she felt comfortable. And so he would not, you know, try and target and recruit that person. He would recruit and target the individuals who he went up to and said, you're beautiful. And they looked down and, and clearly he was feeling a need. And so, you know, as Wendy has said, they're very adept at, at, at discovering that need. Um, but there are a lot of other factors that lead into important factors that are that are um, really relevant for everyone to know who's working in this in this area. That there are factors that lead into and make some of those vulnerabilities much more um, poignant and much more able to be exploited. So the ACE study, just to give you a little bit of background on it, it was actually a doctor um, in the '90s in um, uh, San Diego, Kaiser. And it was actually a doctor that was doing research. He couldn't, he, he was a doctor, a weight loss doctor. And he was trying to determine why some people were successful on losing the weight and other people were not. So he started doing these surveys and what came out of it was people who had adverse childhood experiences were more susceptible to um, different types of health disparities. Um, go ahead, next slide. Um, you know, you, you could end up, you know, people who had more ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, would suffer from substance abuse, mental health problems, instability due to parental separation and household members being in jail or prison. So these are all things that, you know, when they dealt with it, or when they had these experiences, they ended up with actual health problems. Um, some potentially traumatic events are experiencing violence, abuse, or neglect at home, witnessing violence in the home or the community, having a family member attempt um, or die from suicide. And there's many more. It's, it, there, there's actually a test. You can go on Google and say ACE test, and you can take that test. 
Not to say um, that a person with a high ACE score is definitely going to have more issues in life. Um, for instance, my ACE, um, I have an eight. It's a, it's a score of one to 10. I have an eight. I ended up having a horrible life. I have all kinds of health problems. Um, my daughter, my daughter, my baby I talked about earlier, her ACE score is a 10. But yet she's very well put together. Um, you know, she has a few health problems, but it, it, you know, but you can still take this information and help use it to determine if somebody is going to have some of these issues. I know for me also, it's not necessarily these horrible traumatic things. My ACEs were bullying. I was bullied in school for having a red hair and freckles from kindergarten to the sixth grade. That was detrimental to me. Um, the second ACE was um, parental absence. My mom and dad divorced when I was eight years old. Um, third was poverty. That gave kids another reason to make fun of me. And it also gave me a sense of that I'm not worth, uh, you know, any money. Um, you know, just, I had no worth. And then final factor was child sexual abuse. You take all four of those factors, and that is what left me feeling lost, alone, and unloved. So go ahead, next slide. Um, so, you know, you take these things and you have lasting negative effects on your health, well-being, and opportunities. This can, you know, th through this study, it has shown that this can increase the risk for um, sexually transmitted infections, uh, maternal and child health maternal and child health problems, teen pregnancy, involvement in sex trafficking, and a wide range of chronic diseases and leading causes of death, such as cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and suicide. Go ahead, next slide. You know, when we deal with um, ACEs, it actually changes the makeup of our brains, the way that we see life. And two people could experience something one person, a divorce could happen in the family and the child not really be affected by it at all. Whereas another child where the parents get a divorce can drastically affect them. Um, each of these ACEs changes the brain chemistry and changes the way that we see life. Is life safe? Is life unsafe? Are people you know, are people good? Are people bad? And all of these things end up determining or influencing the way that we make decisions, the way that we learn. Um, so go ahead, Jen. Yeah. And so I would just add too that when you take, you know, these ACE factors and you add, you know, under resourced neighborhoods, racially segregated neighborhoods, um, frequent moves, when you, and, and food insecurity and some of these other underlying factors. Um, it really then leads to this level of toxic stress that leads to what you were just discussing and, and difficulty forming um, healthy and stable relationships and really just um, exacerbates and can exacerbate a lot of these vulnerabilities that traffickers prey on. Um, and really kind of when you combine then this lack of, it, this all kind of combines to this lack of opportunity, right? And lack of options. Um, when you take kind of these, these needs that we all have and take some away and, and then add a vulnerability, like we've talked about for some of these factors, whatever that vulnerability may be, um, you're then kind of left on this path of, of making def desperate decisions that leads to exploitation. Um, but I know, Wendy, you, you even view this as it's, it's not decisions that are being made. It's, it, it's, it's just not if you're at this point and you're dealing with all of this already. Yeah, I always say that um, a choice cannot be made out of a place of desperation. When a person is in a desperate situation, when your brain stops working, you're not able to, you don't have common sense when you're in a desperate situation. Um, just as an example, let's say you're going hiking up in the hills with a friend and you slip and fall and you start tumbling down a really steep, steep cliff. At that point that you're 
going head over heels and you're falling? Are you sitting there thinking about, oh, I wonder which branch of a tree or rock I should try and grab onto? Which one is going to hold me, you know, hold my weight? You're not thinking about that. You're just out there grasping at anything to stop your fall. You're needing to stop the desperation, the desperate state that you're in. And I think about, you know, you know, and let's just say, you know, you grab onto a twig or something that stops your fall and you're hanging there, but then the twig breaks and you start falling down more and your friend is up at the top of the hill going, you know, you should have made better decisions or you should have made a better choice. And I don't think of that if we're not making that choice. How many times did I, you know, from the outside view, you would think Wendy is making a choice to go out and work the street tonight. And that never would have been my choice. That is not within me to do that. But, you know, that's, it takes bravery to walk out onto the street. But yet I was doing that. I was, you know, taking this action, but it was based out of desperation. So it wasn't really a choice. Right. And that leads uh, so many times into what we've talked about already is traffickers, traffickers are there and they are there to exploit that and to, um, and to really prey on that with individuals. And I think, you know, this kind of leads this, that arrow kind of also leads into how we kind of try to contemplate how our relationship goes from good or seemingly good to one that is bad to one that then becomes violent and then exploitative, right? It's not, this doesn't happen overnight, right? It's a long process. And I think that's really important that that long process is important for people to understand um, when they're when they're thinking about these cases and looking at these cases and working with victims and survivors in this area. It doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, and you know, I mean, there has been some talk about, I don't know if a study has actually been done or not, but the longer that a person is groomed, the longer that person is in that bad relationship. You know, it, it happens very slowly. You know, first a trafficker is going to get you attached to them, especially in the intimate partner, you know, you know, the intimate partner type of trafficking, they really get your emotions attached. This love grows. Then little things happen. First it's probably verbal abuse, but then I'm sorry, I won't ever do it again. Then it goes to maybe pushing or shoving, you know, and then it's slowly asking you to do just a little bit more. You know, the first time he had me work the street, it was to get diapers and formula. One time, one time, you'll never have to do it again. But then the next time, it's no, you need to do a couple more, but then you won't have to do it again. Then it rolled into, no, you need to start doing this all the time. And so, you know, there is, it, it goes slowly. Um, and that grooming process is very specific to each person. You know, um, you know, for me, it was, you know, having a family, having our child together, um, you know, that, you know, attached us, whereas other people, it may have been, you know, they wanted wealth, they wanted a great life, they wanted a mansion or whatever, you know, maybe they just wanted to get away from their parents, you know, I mean, so each Traffickers will target victims and then um, individualize how they're going to groom them. Um, you know, how long is it going to take? You know, is this person more, you know, because there were, there were other people that, you know, hey, he would meet them and within two weeks they were out working the street for him. But it's very individualized. And I think, you know, it's important to mention too at this point that you know, when we talk about intimate partner sex trafficking, it can range, you know, that intimate relationship can range from, you know, something more akin to like a, a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, to all the way up to being married and having a family with that individual, right? It just, and, and so intimate, the intimate partner sex trafficking relationship is really varied. Um, and, and I think people will find as they start to look closer at these cases that many, many trafficking relationships involve this intimate partner relationship. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think just moving on to this next power and control wheel, 
you know, you've mentioned, you know, a lot of these tactics that were used, right? And, and I think everyone or most people are pretty familiar with this power and control wheel that's used in domestic violence, domestic abuse cases, um, you know, coercion and threats, intimidation. Um, people are very familiar with this wheel um, and maybe a little bit less familiar with the um, human trafficking power and control wheel, which can, was adopted from that. But there is a, a, a very large amount of overlap here. Um, and a lot of these methods are used in both intimate partner relationships and intimate partner sex trafficking relationships. So really, people are already very familiar with how this looks. Um, these commonalities are really kind of far reaching. The sexual violence and the abuse, um, the coercion and threats, the intimidation, the emotional abuse and isolation. Um, minimizing, denying, and blaming, um, using privilege and economic abuse. I mean, these are, everyone can read them for themselves, but these are all of things we're very familiar with of tactics that offenders use to maintain control and coerce um, individuals into behaving in a certain way. Um, you know, the what's interesting to note here though, is that physical violence and using children are not noted in this human trafficking power and control wheel which is just, you know, something to note for everybody here listening, child traffickers for sure use children in the same way that in a, in a domestic violence, intimate partner relationship, um, many traffickers threaten to take children away. And we'll talk about that more late, more later, but, and physical violence is a, um, is a hallmark of, of a lot of human trafficking. So that's just, um, important to note. And I know, um, Wendy, you've used this power and control wheel in your work with, with survivors. Yeah, a lot of times I must tell you, you know, add in that many times a, a victim that we're talking to, they don't understand how they are a victim of human trafficking. They just don't even, what are you talking about? But then when we show them this wheel, that light bulb goes off and they go, oh my gosh, this is what's happening to me. And even they can may not even still identify as a trafficking victim because that is it's it's such a I don't even know how to explain it. You know, I still you know it took me a really long time to figure out. Oh yeah, I'm a victim of trafficking. That's you know it was just odd to me. But this I can say yeah, my my abuser did all of this to me. Um, so yeah, so this this wheel I would I highly suggest it. I highly suggest it when working with somebody. Um, that maybe, you know, not understanding their own situation to, you know, share this wheel with them. Right. And I think um, along those lines of, of not, you know, identifying, we all know, you know, many of us know who have worked in this field and who, you know, who work with, with victims and survivors of trafficking. Um, you know, there is, there are so many barriers of disclosure and there are reasons, or so many barriers to leaving, but there's also a lot of reasons why victims don't disclose um, when they're talking to law enforcement, when they're talking to prosecutors, or even when they're talking to service providers, um, you know, not only is it, you know, for all the reasons we already know, right, this intense fear of law enforcement, there's shame that goes along with it, fear of the, the abuser and what will happen if they, if they disclose loyalty and, and feelings of love and, and trauma bonds to the abuser. I mean, these are just fear of immigration consequences. There are so many reasons why we're all familiar that trafficking victims don't disclose, but also it's because, you know, many, as you said, don't identify as, as I'm a human trafficking victim and, and some don't even know what those words mean. Right. And, and, you know, we, we work with someone who was describing to me that, um, you know, she had been out of the life and out of, you know, that world and, and away from her trafficker for years. And she didn't, really even understand human trafficking until she was watching a, a documentary on Netflix and she was it kind of a light bulb went off and she was like, oh, I, that's what happened to me. And so it's just, it's really something that's important to keep in mind when you're working um, with individuals in front of you that, um, that that's not something that maybe is even identifiable, let alone um, something that they want to disclose. So we're going to talk about that a little bit in interviewing, but um so we talked about all these commonalities between, um, you know, what the, those methods that are used in intimate partner cases and or intimate partner violence um, relationships and sex trafficking relationships. There is a lot of overlap, and I, I hope everyone can take that away to understand that what they're looking at is very similar. They're looking for a lot of the similar dynamics. However, 
intimate partner sex trafficking is also very unique for a couple, a couple main reasons, right? There's that forced or coerced commercial sex, whether it's through prostitution, stripping, um, webcams, or pornography. Um, there is that forced and added element of commercial sex, um, which just in, in many ways um, really enhances that feeling of isolation and that feeling of other that traffickers really try to say um, is happening, right? No one will understand you, we're us. And, you know, and there's this shame that goes along with it. So really, and the, the criminal activity, right? So all of that adds an extra element of that isolation um, that's even more heightened. And then traffickers, you know, for reasons we've talked about already, really try to foster this feeling of family and foster this feeling of um, of loyalty and, and to really create those trauma bonds. And they do that by, you know, very, um, very, uh, purposefully by using words like, you know, call me daddy and calling and, and calling other women working in the organization, sister wives and wife in laws, um, and fostering competition, right. That's another way that, that there's that control and that, and that, um, method of, of trauma, of, of fostering competition among them. Um, but also there's, there's a, a sense of, of belonging and a sense of, um, of responsibility. And that's very complex. So in my case, um, so over the 13 years that I was trafficked, um, the trafficking ring, it consisted of anywhere between four to 10 girls at any given time. Um, some of the girls would come and go, you know, there'd be different girls, but, you know, there were some that were there for, you know, three years, five years, even eight years, and then 10 years, like myself. And we do, we become very connected because we're not allowed to really have outside, we're not allowed to have friends outside of our circles. So it is um, very secluded, very controlled, um, and we too, we become very close and attached. Um, there is, you know, competition in a way, you know, who's going to make the most money tonight because the person who makes the most money is going to get treated the best. The person who makes the least money is going to be treated the worst. They may be the ones that get the beatings at night. Um, there's also, a, a, you know, this connection, this bond. To give an example, we realize that I remember one time there was a group of about five of us together and we realized that, you know, one person would always be treated like a queen and then the person that made the least money would be treated really badly. And we've always felt bad for the person who didn't make as much money. So we would get together prior to coming home and we would divvy up the money to the penny so that we all made the same exact, you know, amount so that you know, that competition wasn't there. Um, he caught on to this very, very quickly and we all got into trouble. Um, but also, uh, you know, during the time that I was trafficked, I had three children with my trafficker. My children were very connected, were very close to all the other girls that were there. We raised our children together. You know, in fact, my language you know, it took me years and years and years to stop saying we, we were beaten, we had to go out and work the street, we did drugs together, you know, we were in dangerous life threatening situations together, you know, we, you know, and so it is, it is embedded in us and that connection, you don't want to leave that almost. Um, go ahead, next slide. And I think, you know, we have talked about, um, you know, really intimate partner sex trafficking relationships really are so heightened and that, you know, when the relationship is bad, it's very, very bad for, for many reasons, um, especially with intimate partners who get to know um, victims so well, the punishments that meted out are so personal. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, for, so the, my trafficker, would find out what is the worst thing that could happen to you or what is the worst situation and like for me I never ever would want anybody to suffer on my behalf I never wanted anybody I, I'm a very kind and loving and caring person and for anybody to suffer because of something that I did I, I can't live with myself and so what do you think my punishment was 
when I messed up, Greg would make me watch him beat one of the other girls. And he would sit there and say, this is your fault. This is your fault in front of all of us. All the girls would be looking at me. It's my fault. I did something wrong. And now somebody else was being beaten for it. Um, you know, punishments are always also, you know, very tailored. Um, for me, it was my children a lot of times that he, he, he knew my children were very, very special to me. And so one of the times um, I left, I, I, I tried leaving many, many times, um, but the very last time that I had left him, um, he, I found out that he was beating one of the other girls daily um, if she could not find me and bring me back. And he beat her so bad that he ruptured her spleen. So um, I, I did, I returned, she begged me to come back. She begged me to come back, promising me that I would never have to work the street again. And, you know, and so I came back upon my return, he uh, put me in the room and I was there for three days. For three days, he had me smoking crack cocaine. He tortured me, um, interrogating me. He wanted to know everywhere that I had been during that six months or no, I think it was only like 45 days that I was away from him that time. So, you know, he wanted to know everywhere I had been, everybody I'd spoken to, um, just this interrogation that was just terrible. On the third day of being awake, no sleep, um, he came and he put a Bible in front of my face and he said, swear to God on the Bible that you're never going to leave me again. So I placed my hand on the Bible and I swore to God that I would never leave him again. But then he got this very evil look in his eye and he said, no, you swear to God that if you ever leave me again, may God strike our son down in a painful and horrible death. So I placed my hand on the Bible and I made the promise that would keep me there forever, but would make the pain and suffering stop. And from that point, I would not, um, I, I never left him again after that. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, because of that promise, um, other promises. I know there was another girl that, um, her grandmother, her grandmother had raised her. Her grandmother was very, very special to her and he would just threaten her. Um, you know, I'll go up there and I'll blow up your grandmother's house. And that's what kept her there. Um, one of the other girls, I, I, there was this really young girl, I'd say she was probably about 14 years old. The only thing that he ever had to do to punish her, I mean, and, and to threaten her or to keep her in control. He never beat her. He never even got her addicted to drugs. The only thing he had to do was he would walk over to a telephone, pick it up, look her right in the eye and say, do you want me to call your mother right now and let her know exactly what you've been doing? that threat of her mom finding out that she was a prostitute is what kept her there for an entire two years. Um, so go ahead, next slide. Well, and just to, oh. just to add, just to, I'll just add on two more, you know, obviously um, you're also adding on arrests in intimate partner sex trafficking relationships, right? You're being arrested many times over and over, um, which is even more um, harmful for obvious reasons as in you know, criminal convictions and the trauma that goes along with the arrests. But again, it's just, um, and, and many times being treated very um, inhumanely and, and feeling shame from that. Um, and, and then the sexual and physical violence that's happening that's, that's unique to intimate partner sex trafficking many times obviously at, at the hands of the trafficker, but also at the hands of buyers and at the hands of, or, or Johns and at the hands of, of sometimes law enforcement. Um, and so those are all added elements that are just really, um, you know, unique to um, intimate partner sex trafficking um, as opposed to an intimate partner relationship. Um, and, and when it's good, it's it's still bad. So even if it looks good or even if it feels good, it's, it's still bad it's still bad. And I think, so, you know, sometimes in domestic violence relationships, we see in, in intimate partner violence relationships, we see 
um, you know, a, a kind of a honeymoon phase and then, and then threats building up and then an act of violence or, and then kind of the honeymoon phase again. And, and with trafficking, a lot of times what we see is these occasional indulgences and occasional and, and these perceived benefits um, mixed in with, with kind of illogical reasons for being punished and these personal punishments sometimes that kind of come out of nowhere and to keep the victims, it's, it's a very specific method traffickers use to keep victims on their toes and to keep them in this constant state of anxiety and alert. Um, and, you know, I know you've talked about in, in occasional indulgences in, in, in what happened in your, um, your situation. Yeah. So you have to understand how when a person is so beaten down over time, like, like we said, this happens little by little, step, 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 step. So imagine if you are starving to death, if you have not eaten in five days, if you have not eaten in five days and somebody comes and hands you a cracker, you're gonna be like, oh man, that cracker is so good. Oh my God, this is a great cracker. You know, oh, can I have another one, please? That is almost the mindset that we are in. So just little tiny things like I remember how once every six months, and I know this, I always say it's hard to understand this. And the only way that you can totally 100% understand is to be there. So I hope and pray that you will never 100% understand. But I mean, him bringing me one red rose every six months and telling me how much he loves me was just, it, that would keep me going through another six months of misery because just that moment of him saying, I love you, that meant so much to me. Um, you know, like, you know, we would, we would go, you know, if we did really well, we, he would take us out to the beach for the day and we'd all hang out and go swimming and the kids would be having fun and we all have fun together. And so, you know, and this is the time where pictures are taken, you know, we're all out having fun. Yes, we are. You know, we didn't have to go out and work the street last night. Um, you know, um, let me see here, you know, and the online presence, you know, it's like, what do I say? If I said, hey, everybody, I'm going to take a picture of all of you right now. What are we all going to do? We're all going to smile. We all smile for the camera, you know, and so just having that online presence, you know, it, that is, it, it, don't let that um, just say, oh, well, look, they're happy. They want to do this. They, you know, they are choosing to do this. Um, I think we see that a lot in, you know, as, as prosecutors and law enforcement, you know, I, many times defense attorneys or would come up and say, Hey, look, there's, look, there's these pictures. They're at Disneyland. They're at the beach. They're skiing. They're happy. She loves him. Like this is, this is, you know, this is, this is a ritually, um, what happens, but I think, uh, you know, in our work, you have to really be careful about that and really, and not shy away from it and know that it's going to be there, right? It's, it's part and parcel of, of the coercion. And really it's evidence in your case to show that there is this coercion, um, in a much more seemingly benign, but really is very powerful, right? Um, it's keeping, you know, those feelings of love and that, that semblance of family, um, and a lot of those coerce that that's all coercion. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about later using experts to kind of explain it, but, you know, it's important not to shy away from that because that's really important evidence in your case. And it does not mean that you're, you know, what you're dealing with is not sex trafficking by any means. It's part and parcel of it. Um, and then, you know, that kind of goes along with, we have all these complex dynamics that are at play um, in intimate partner sex trafficking relationships, right? And in, in a lot of the re trafficking relationships, you have this, you have shame for, for what's happening and shame for what's, what's going on and shame for, for what you're doing and, and the arrests, you feel guilt. Um, and you feel all of this trauma for all of these reasons that has been, um, that we've been talking about. Um, and there's feelings of loyalty that are very specifically ingrained by, by the trafficker. And then you have these feelings of, of love and family on top of that as well, especially in an intimate partner, sex trafficking relationship, that's really kind of the hallmarks of it. Um, and really can, can be used to, to control and to coerce victims into doing all sorts of things, um, including, and then you have this complicity, um, traffickers are incredibly adept at shielding themselves from liability. They don't wanna get caught. They aren't the ones that are on the street committing crimes. 
um, or, or engaging in this criminal activity. Um, they're, they're not the ones that, that they don't want to get in trouble, right? So they have all of, for all of these other methods of coercion to um, get their victims to go out and to engage in criminal activity. And so as prosecutors in law enforcement, we really need to, to think about, is this complicity or is this coercion? What is this looking like? And there's this forced criminality, the, this prostitution, drug use or sales, theft crimes, um, forgeries, robberies of, of, of Johns and, and buyers, um, drug sales to Johns or buyers, and, and drug use um, many times for what we've talked about. A lot of victims are um, engaged in substance use to, to be able to cope, but also traffickers use that to use drugs to, um, to coerce victims into to doing things they, they don't want to do and or withhold it if they are already addicted. Um, and then there's forced complicity, right? Forced complicity in, in the recruiting and the transporting, placing ads and enforcing rules. And all of this can look like complicity and criminality when you are working in this area. But really, um, you know, the goal is to have everybody think really twice about that after hearing everything today and hearing everything that's going on. So Jen, can you um, go back to the last slide just for a second? Sure. Yes, and this just popped up just as we were talking, but I, I'm really, I would love to find out if these are almost the same, uh, same as a cult, because I would definitely, I would definitely um, see the situation that I was in the trafficking ring. It was very, very cult-like. Um, you know, another reason that this is so complex is like, you know, I loved Greg. I loved him with all my heart. I love the other women, you know, um, but did I think about killing him a lot? Yes. I hated him. I hated him. I loved him. Um, go ahead and go back to, I just want to mention that, but yeah. so some of the things like, you know, um, you know, the theft, like, you know, for my trafficker, I don't know, other traffickers, I guess they actually buy their um, uh, girls stuff, our trafficker, no, we had to steal everything. We, you know, clothes, food, condoms, kids' toys, Christmas presents, whatever it was, he never, all money went to him and he spent the money wherever he wanted to spend it. Anything that we needed, we had to go out and steal. So all of us had extensive theft, you know, uh, you know, theft cr criminal records on theft. Also, um, he got most of us addicted to crack cocaine, you know, and of course the prostitution. Um, for as far as recruiting, I remember one of the girls. Um, she ended up pregnant, and he told her, and she was actually during this time frame, she was the biggest money maker. Um, you know, she, she out, out did us a lot. And he basically told her said, if you want to keep the baby, you have to go out and recruit a girl to make the same amount of money as you. And you have to be the one to basically pimp her out. You have to pimp around if you want to keep your baby. She wanted to keep her baby. So she did. Did she know that it was wrong? Did she want to do it? No, she didn't want to do it. But she had to make that choice. Am I going to have an abortion or am I going to keep my baby and recruit somebody else? Um, for me, the transporting, I remember Greg would just, you know, if we didn't go out and make money, we were going to be at home getting beat. So, you know, I was the only one with a driver's license. And so he would make me do all of the driving. He said, get in the car, go drive, you know? And so here I am, I'm, you know, 27 years old and I'm driving around 14 year old girls to go turn tricks. Oh, when I think about it now, it's like, oh my God, are you freaking nuts, Wendy? But at that point, the only thing I, as far as I could see, was the choice was between us getting beat or me doing this. Those were the only two choices I had. Was it a choice? No, it was just like this act of desperation. Um, oh, there was another one. What was it? Um, one of the, I mean, and, and I can't even believe that I'm saying, when I'm saying this, 
know that you know, I can't even understand it. So I don't expect for you to understand this whatsoever at all. And when I see, when I say this, trust me, I despise this person that did this, which I don't feel like it was me. I don't even feel like it was me. But I remember one time uh, Greg had been grooming this girl for, and she was 14 years old. He had been grooming her for about six months. And know that we're not allowed to talk about this at all. It's not a thing where he's saying, hey, I'm doing this or I'm doing that. It's very, very secretive. We're not allowed, to, each of us are not allowed to talk about our relationship with Greg. If we're caught talking about our relationship, we get beaten. And so this one time, this 14 year old girl comes in and she's crying and she's saying, I have to go out on the street tonight, right? It's making me go out and make money. You know, I have to go out there and I'm so scared and I'm so scared. And out of the kindness of my heart, I say, well, why don't I hook you up with one of my tricks so you don't have to go out there and you can do it here in the house. You would think this was a, you know, and you wonder, was this a setup by Greg? I, I don't know, but I mean, I'm doing it out of the kindness of my heart thinking, I don't want her out there on the street. I, you know, I don't want her to be so scared. So I'll hook her up with one of my safe regulars. Um, and so, you know, and, and we were required enforcing rules that we weren't really enforcing rules, but we were required to tell on each other. We had to, he would make us, you know, swear to God, swear to God, put your hand on the Bible and swear to God. What did she do wrong? What did he do wrong? You know, he would interrogate us over and over and over again, you know, almost daily, we would be interrogated beyond belief. And, you know, what color car did she get into? And if I said, well, it was a dark blue car and somebody else said, well, it was a dark green car, you know, it's dark, we, you know, we're, we're making the we're being honest as we can, but then we get interrogated and beaten because our answers did not match up. Um, so, okay, yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we have, it, it's really important, you've said a lot of really kind of important things for everybody to hear too, and that, you know, when you're, you know, you're looking at something and from the outside, it looks like one thing is you're assessing culpability and thinking about this kind of scale of hundred percent culpable or hundred percent victim. It's really important um, to kind of keep, keep this in mind and to think about what's probably going on behind the scenes that you don't know about. And, um, and so, uh, you know, we have a webinar about this, which please reach out to us if you're interested. Um, but then, you know, when, when you're kind of, I think it's important too, to think about these effects of the traffickers tactics, right? When you're sitting um, and interviewing um, as a prosecutor or law enforcement agent or, or survive a, a service provider, when you're interviewing someone, there's all of these types of harms that are being inflicted by these, by the traffickers tactics, right? Everything on this side, on this left side of your screen is being inflicted many times, multiple different types of harm, if not all of them at once. And so the way that, that, those coping mechanisms that are on the right side of the screen really are what manifest themselves to the outside world, right? So many times we're not seeing the, the types of harm that happens in private, that happens, um, you know, behind closed doors. That's not what, what you're, what the outside world is seeing, but these coping mechanisms a lot are what present themselves. Um, you know, violence or victims that are, you know, using substances or engaging in, in disassociation or masking um, or victimizing others. Like you said, there's all of these coping mechanisms to help deal with that harm. And as someone, you know, interviewing or talking to um, in the, in the real world, this is how it's, this is how it's manifested, right? Um, I've had a victim who was 13, who threw a chair in the middle of an interview um, and, you know, just by patience and kind of trying to understand and meet her where she was two years later, she was testifying against her three traffickers and rapists and, you know, is, is now doing very well, but it, it, you know, it's something really that is, is imperative to keep in mind uh, that what you're seeing in front of you, you really, you really need to kind of, kind of think about everything else and think about what's going on behind the scenes. You know, and, you know, I mean, like self-harm, I can't even tell you how many times I tried killing myself while in the life. I mean, literally, I, I can't even count how many times. The substance use, it wasn't always, it was there to control us, but it was also there to soothe us 
you know, at least I get to get high. Um, you know, disassociation was a huge factor because I mean, like I said, I am one of the quietest, scaredest, I, I'm afraid of everything. So to even go out onto the street and get into a stranger's car, that's not something I can do. That's not something I can do. So I remember I literally, when I would go and put on my makeup to go out onto the street and work, it was a literal mask. I was turning into somebody else. I literally would, you know, as I was putting on my makeup, I would turn into this other person that could get into a stranger's car, that could have sex with 10 different people in a night. You know, that's just not something that I could do. Um, you know, and I think what pops out here is the feelings of hopelessness. Until you have been in the place where you truly 100% feel no hope. And then that little hope that's given to you is simply being with him, you know, we'll love, or we're going to have something someday. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's, a, it, it's, your mind is just, it is so scrambled. It is so blurred. You cannot see what's right or wrong. You cannot see who yourself is anymore. You don't even, you can't even describe who you are because you don't even know yourself. So go ahead. And that scrambling and, and feeling of such, you know, feeling so um, in it, is means that it is such a process to transition out, right? It is such a process that requires such patience on everybody's part, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, and for me, this part was so easy for him. I don't know, I mean, just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. And how many times did I hear that? You know, I, I heard it countless times and you would think that a person with, common sense, let's say, <laughs> you know, they would realize, okay, they don't mean this, but there was no other option, really. There was no other, what, are, what is the other option but to believe it? We were almost forced to believe that, you know, okay, he does love me just in his own crazy way and things will get better and, you know, this isn't going to go on forever. And so it's these promises, this carrot that they put in front of you and, and he'll just shine the light on the carrot, you know, and you don't even see anything else for that little bit of time until the cycle starts going again. And that all, that all goes with why it's hard to leave, right? You've talked about the dream, but there's all of these other, other things that are going on as well, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, just like you have, so for me, leaving Greg, um, one, the attachment from the children, I would leave and the kids would go, you know, mommy, I want to see daddy. I want to see daddy. Um, you know, he, I had no no or bad credit, bad credit, you know, or no credit at different times of that 13 years, but, you know, trying to get an apartment. We have been kicked out of every single apartment we ever lived in. We typically could only live somewhere anywhere from a month to six months before being evicted because of all the loud noise and all the in and out activity. And so I couldn't get an apartment on my own. You know, uh, you know, how do I interact with outside people? The longer that you're there in the life, the farther away from reality you are. And so just having a conversation with somebody was just, you know, it was so uncomfortable. You know, you don't know, you don't, I mean, I remember one time after getting out of the life and stuff, I remember somebody saying, hey, you wanna go out for coffee? And it was like, what does that mean? Go out for coffee? I don't understand this, you know? Also, like, you know, how many times did I run to domestic violence shelters during that time? Um, I remember, I can give you one example. I remember going to a domestic violence shelter. It was a big house in North Seattle, um, huge house, but in each room had three bunk beds in it. So just a regular size room, three bunk beds, and each mother and child 
combo got one bunk bed. So me and my two kids had one bunk bed, another mother and her two kids had another bunk bed. And then another, you know, mother and child had another bunk bed. And I just remember it was just so uncomfortable. It was, I, I think I, I ended up going back. I ended up going back because I couldn't even vision a future for me. And this is life. This is the way I have to live now. You know, I mean, there was just, I, I couldn't even envision getting out of this. And I think that's one thing, just throw this in there. I think that's why it's so, so, so important that survivors that have made it out, that we do highlight them. Because I think if anybody else had said, hey, Wendy, I've been in a situation like this, and this is where I am now. I would have had something to look for, look at, look, you know, you know, look towards. But nobody had ever said, you know, I, I didn't know of anybody that had been through something like me that had made it out alive. Right. And that and that really hits home on this slide and that, you know, staying with the known is easier than than being with the unknown and trying to trying to be around people who you know, this, no one else understands you. If you have other survivors and other peers that are able to, to work with you, that kind of a little bit breaks this cycle, this, this cycle of staying with the known. So I'll just jump in here. So th yeah. I mean, every single one of these are, you know, I mean, you may not, you know, oh, no job experience. That's no big deal. Um, no, it is a huge deal when you're out there trying to get a job and you don't even know how to write a resume. Um, you know, you know, I remember a big saying from Greg is nobody else will ever love you but me. Nobody else is ever going to love you but me. And that does, it gets ingrained into, ingrained into our minds. And we really truly believe that, um, you know, trafficker is the father of your children. Prior attempts at leaving were unsuccessful. Remember that, you know, for domestic violence, I think it's the average of seven times of leaving before you are successful. And I believe it's probably something very similar than that, even when there's trafficking involved. Um, you know, you've tried this so many times to get away and it's never worked out. So you just feel very discouraged. You know, you have no job experience, no financial education, you have no, you know, cannot see other means of survival. Go ahead and flip the page. Um, you know, coping mechanisms make it hard to live a straight life. You know, I don't even know how to, I, I did not, even the language in, from the life to the real world, that's what I call them. There's the real world and then there's the life. Just words and language are um, very different. Um, I, I swore like a sailor. I remember it took me about six years to learn how to say a sentence without a swear word in it. <laughs> Literally, every sentence had a swear word in it. And I didn't even realize, I didn't even realize because it was so ingrained in us. Um, you know, we don't know how to live. We don't know how to take public transportation. Chances are, you know, and I know I didn't, um, you know, law enforcement, you know, they demonstrated that they're not safe. Um, criminal convictions. Oh my God. All I can tell you that I've been out of the life for 20 years for 20 years. I've been out of the life now. Um, so from 30 to 50 now, and still while trying to get my last apartment, Still, I had to go through a whole entire appeal process and explain what happened to me. You know, having a criminal record determines where I can work, where I can live, how much money I can make. It is hard. Um, yes, this where, remind me, the police officer, that's later on. So yeah, go ahead. I think we're going to talk about the child welfare and how that um, also as a barrier and, and a tool that traffickers use, as we discussed, it's not on that, that wheel, but it really should be for a lot of reasons. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, child welfare was called on me. There were times that I called, okay, so I've had child welfare called on me. 
I have called my mother and said, mom, will you please call child welfare on me? I have called them myself. Most times that um, I remember, you know, they would come in, they would look at the children and they say, okay, the children are fine. And they would leave. I remember one time that I called them. I said, uh, I, it was one of the times that I had left Greg. Uh, my son was having, he was laid out on the ground, having one of those fits at the, at the Lloyd, Lloyd Center Mall in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon. And I, and I just, I called CVS, but I don't know what to do. I need help. I need help. I, I, I don't even know what to do. And they said, do you beat your children? And I was like, no, I don't beat my children. And they said, sorry, we can't help you. The final time that I can tell you to share a good story though, um, after my third child was born during the, my pregnancy, and trust me, I feel horrible about this. I, I did use drugs throughout my pregnancy. So my son was born positive for crack cocaine. Of course, you know, the, the, you know, healthcare, the hospital called CPS out. CPS came out to the hospital to talk to me. This time was different than any other time because the lady had sat there and talked to me for about a good 45 minutes. After that time, um, she said, you know what? She goes, I don't think you're a bad mom. I think you need help. I was just like, yeah. <laughs> and so she let me keep Michael. Um, and she said, okay, you got to come back to this appointment in one week. In one week, you and Michael come to this address. You're going to meet, you know, we're going to start your case up. You're going to, you know, you know, you, we're going to have a case on you, but you can keep your child. I said, okay. And I remember when I went to the appointment, um, I was taken into this large room with this really large table. And I remember there were about six or seven people sitting around this table. It was so intimidating for me. And I was just scared to death. And I remember this guy walks up and said, come here, Wendy, um, come have a seat. We want you to meet your team. Like, my team? <laughs> so I went and I sat down and the first person, you know, over to my left, she introduced herself and, you know, I'm going to get these names all wrong, but, you know, she was like the, um, uh, the nurse, the baby nurse. She goes, I'm going to be, you know, you're the baby's nurse, you know, during your time with CPS and, you know, for you to be able to take care of your baby properly, you need diapers and you need formula. And she went and she placed two big boxes of diapers and then two big boxes of formula in front of me. She goes, here you go. Then the next person went off and said, you know, well, I'm your, I'm your therapist and we're going to ask you to start journaling. So here's a journal for you. And she hands me this journal. They're brand new. I was just like, oh, wow. And then somebody else came. She was like, you know, I'm the, I'm the child play person and we're going to teach you how to play with your child, but you need toys for that. And she hands me all these toys, brand new toys. I remember as each person went around, I had this huge, the, the, all this stuff that they had given me. And I remember the very last person came up and said, so Wendy, I am your case manager and you are going to have a lot of appointments with all these different people. So you're going to need a planner. And he handed me this planner, this brand new, beautiful planner. And I just remember thinking, only important people have planners. They think I'm important. They think I'm important. And I remember as I sat there during this meeting talking, I remember thinking, I wonder if I told them everything. I wonder if I told them what was really happening. Could they protect me and the kids? Would they help us? But I was too afraid. I was too afraid to tell them. And it was soon after that, that the police ended up, you know, coming in and I ended up doing two years in prison. My trafficker ended up doing 10 years in prison, but 
But I really believe that if that had continued, if I had more time with those, those individuals, I think I would have opened up and I would have, you know, told them what was going on and it asked for help, but I needed more time. Yeah. And so I think, I think you're touching on kind of getting into our next topic of, of what you can do, right? We've talked about, we've talked about all of these things that are setting up for all these barriers and all these, and how do you get past that? And how are you able to, to work and to, to move on? And so I think, you know, when we talk about providing meaningful help, you've talked about this a little bit, um, but just, you know, anything else you have to add on this topic of what really meaningful help is, right? What is, what are services that can actually help um, and, and make a difference? Yeah, and just remember each person is different. You know, I may need, you know, computer skills where somebody else may need to learn how to take the bus. I mean, it really is getting to know the person. It's you taking the time to, to, to find out what does that individual person need? Because we all, all are very, very different and we're going to have different needs um, to be able to get to success. And so we've talked a lot about too, like listening to survivors and promoting these buy-in for organizations and really making sure you're connecting, um, you know, connecting individuals with survivors and with um, people that can really kind of provide that peer support. And then really having these really, these wraparound services that includes everything on this list, right? And it's not easy, but it really needs to happen um, to ensure the safety, to, to find housing and benefits, um, to give those education and job skills and, and, and healthcare and, and there's, you know, medical care, just basic medical care, um, financial support, and then legal support in all sorts of ways. And, you know, as prosecutors, um, we can provide that in many ways in terms of really, like I said, assessing culpability of cases and, and, um, and then taking the time to kind of relook at convictions and, and vacature and, and really trying to help with criminal convictions that shouldn't, that shouldn't be there. Um, and then, you know, some identification strategies that we can use. So, you know, really important to cross train anyone who intersects with intimate partner violence and human trafficking, right? These, there's so much crossover in these two areas. So many trafficking cases involve intimate partner violence. Um, and so everyone on this list can play a really, really important role in that. Um, you know, uh, uh, obviously prosecutors and law enforcement we've spoken about, but, you know, probation and parole officers, um, you, you spoke about how child welfare agencies can really, can, could help and, and how, if you'd felt comfortable for a little longer, maybe you would have been able to ask for help. Um, but I know there were also instances with, with other individuals within the system that really made a difference for you. And I think, um, people hearing that can, you know, it's, it's something good people can take away and say, if I do these things, Hopefully I'm making a difference, even if I don't see it. Yeah. So two different cases, and I know we're kind of getting got, you know, I want to make sure we have enough time for question and answers. So one story I want to share is um, of a police officer. This was around, I was about 25 years old at the time. And I'm, I'm, and I apologize now, I'm going to have to leave a lot of pieces out. <laughs> um, but basically I was out on the street working, a police officer pulled up behind me. Um, and I assumed that it would be the regular interaction that usually happen where they say get off of our streets we don't want you here you're dirty you know I'm going to take you to jail very um you know just treat us badly but this time the police officer as he approached me he walked up to me and he said listen I don't want to put you in the position to have to lie to me I know what you're doing out here you know what you're doing out here so let's just bypass that question altogether he says, I do have one question for you. And I'd, I'd really appreciate if you would tell me the truth. I just remember being totally freaked out. I was like, what? It's like, this person's treating me like a human being, kind of. And I didn't say anything, but then he said, he just, he, he, he looked at me and he goes, are you okay? And I was just... I makes a difference. Nobody had ever in my life asked me that question before. Um, 
you know, and, and that story does go on. I don't want to go into it just because of time, you know, but he, he again showed me the next time that I was out there, um, you know, he, 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 Came up, are you okay? He he offered his assistance. He treated me like a human being. Um, also, when I like when I got out of prison, um, you know, so here I'm finally away from Greg, but I don't know how to talk to men. I, I, I I'm still my brain is still controlled by all the rules, the regulations that I had been under for so long. And my first parole officer was a guy. Well, actually, all of them were, but you know, so here this first parole officer that I had and. But this parole officer, he saw me for who I was. And I just remember he took his time getting to know me. He offered, you know, I started school, I started college, and he would say, you know, Wendy, if you ever have a problem, call me. If you need help with your homework, call me, come in, we'll work on your homework together. You know, and I remember a time I was in class, I was just bawling, I start bawling my head off and I don't even know why. I don't even know why all of a sudden I'm in class and I start crying and I can't stop crying. And I walk outside and I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I don't have any, I haven't made any connections yet outside in the real world. And he was the only person I could think of. And so I called him up and he heard me cry and he says, you get in here right now, come here right now. And I was able to go in there and just talk to him. And, you know, and then we sat there and we did my homework together. So the point is just, you know, I always say, you know what? I think all of our purpose, our purpose on this earth is to show how much we care through our actions. Through our actions, show a person how much you care. Bye. Yeah. And it, and it can make a difference, even if you don't see it, you know, as a prosecutor or a law enforcement agent or service provider, if you don't see it that in that moment, it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter down the road. Right. Um, and I just, I, I really think it's important for people to take that away. Um, some identification, continuing identification strategies, just very quickly are screen these types of cases, because as we know, there may be um, trafficking victims and survivors that you're working with, and please reach out to Equitas and we can talk about some of the indicators and provide some screening tools and, and things of that nature if you're interested. Um, and just quickly, the keys kind of to investigating intimate partner sex trafficking Really, these are these are really important um, kind of just bullet points. You really need to build trust and rapport, which we're going to talk about in a second. Communicate honestly about the process, making sure make sure you're explaining to anyone you're working with what's actually happening, um, and don't make promises you can't keep. And really and really be honest about everything because people can handle it and they want to know that. And and it's that's important and that will kind of build that trust and rapport. Um, leverage skill sets of your different investigators. Um, and then conduct trauma-informed interviews, which we're going to talk about in a second, and proactively investigate witness intimidation. Um, so just with, along with this building trust and rapport, uh, make sure, I mean, this goes without saying, but but it needs to be, it, it does need to be said, is that you really need to treat everyone with dignity and, dignity and respect, which I, I think Wendy is, has already really touched on why that's so important. And it's really important to recognize the complex dynamics of intimate partner sex trafficking. I know in your first interview, um, with law enforcement, Wendy, that what you had been told kind of gave the police officer a completely different um, uh, understanding of what you were really, what was really going on with you. Yeah. So, um, so in our case, when the raid came, you know, when the police came, they took Greg out and then they came to me and they said, we need to take you down to the police station to ask you some questions. So they handcuffed me. Um, and like I said, I have to squeeze this, shorten the story a lot. Um, and they finally, they put me in this little room and two male police officers came in to talk to me. Well, we're not allowed to talk to police. I mean, men, unless they're tricks. And so the only thing that I could think of is how bad is Greg going to beat me tonight if he finds out that I had talked to them? I couldn't even fathom that they would have enough information against him. He always got away with everything. He always, he, he had manipulated police in the past. You know, he's gotten away with so much, even with authorities, that I'm thinking he's going to be home tonight and I'm going to be home tonight. And if I speak to these two men, 
I'm going to get, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. And so I just remember doing what Greg had always told me to do if ever in that situation. And that was, you put your eyes to the ground and you don't say a word. So I did what Greg told me to, I put my eyes to the ground, I didn't say anything. They took this as an act of defiance. And they said, fine, you want to play that game? You're going to be charged with everything that Greg is being charged with. I had 26 felony charges and my bail was $3 million. So another thing just to step, uh, say really quick is, you know, like when trying to build that rapport, another thing, don't ask, like, if, you know, I think offering food is always something great. It's everybody needs food, but don't say, oh, are you hungry? Do you want something to eat? They're going to automatically say no. Instead, give them choices of, hey, you know, we have Sprite, Diet Coke, Coke, and Dr. Pepper. Which one would you prefer? Hey, we have Doritos, uh, corn chips, and, you know, nacho chips or whatever. Which would you prefer? Go with questions that just give options where no, you know, then if they still say no, then respect that. But, you know, give them just throw out the options. Hey, do you want to sit in this room or do you want to sit in that room? You know, do you want two blankets, three blankets, or four blankets? You know, would you like a pillow or a teddy bear to hold? You know, uh, I think that's always a really good thing to make a person feel like a human. Yeah, and I think you've always said what's really important to keep in mind is you don't, you know, even well-meaning investigators and prosecutors and service providers and really anyone can, you know, mean to do something nice, but really end up actually um, mimicking some of the behavior of the traffickers, right? Like not giving choices, not listening to, you know, to the victim or the survivor you're working with as to what's the most important to them. What needs do they need met right now? How can you help them? And really kind of trusting that, um, you know, walking the walk, treating victims like victims. So, you know, it's very important. Don't make services subject, you know, quid pro quo, right? If, if someone, if you believe someone's a victim, whether they're cooperating or disclosing to you at the time or not, services, providing them with those meaningful access to services is incredibly important in building that trust and rapport. Um, and then trauma-informed interviews, I'm just gonna kind of quickly hit on some, some points. Um, we've talked about, like you just said, Wendy, like thinking about who's in the room with the person thinking about making sure you understand what power dynamics are going on. Some victims want to talk to feel more comfortable talking to men. Some feel more comfortable talking to women, ask questions. Um, be careful of the language you use mimic kind of a survivor's language. Um, and, um, allow for the survivor to have, um, as much control as they're comfortable with. So including, you know, if you don't want to answer this question that I'm going to ask you, you know, please let me know, just let me know. And I won't ask it right now, or we can come back to it later. Um, instead of kind of that coercive behavior of, of forcing someone to ask questions, um, you know, expect inconsistencies. Um, if possible, don't take notes or have someone else taking notes and, and explain why you're doing that and what's being written and say, hey, if you want to look at them at the end, you can, right? So so it's all, it's all um, a very open process and all of that goes to building that trust and to really conducting um, these trauma-informed interviews. Um, and then just, just very basic trauma-informed questions, right? Many times victims have been with their traffickers for weeks, months, years. There's all of this going on and trying to um, get a, a consistent timeline or try to, trying to get all of that at once is just not going to happen. So really being patient and asking these questions about sensory details, asking these questions about the emotional response, that's going to get details and that's going to be a way um, to, to kind of access some of that information in, in, a, um, in a very kind of victim-centric way. Um, a colleague uses this magic word of able, right? So the power of able. What are you able to tell me about? Are you able to remember? Let me know what you are able to remember about. And it really communicates to the victim that you, you understand they, they're, they're not going to be able to remember everything necessarily. It gives them the power to say, I don't remember, I don't know. Um, it reduces the likelihood that they're telling you what you want to hear or just filling in blanks. Um, so all of that's really important in terms of making sure you're really, um, you know, going through the criminal justice system can be a very empowering, um, 
and an empowering uh, thing for victims, but it really needs to be done on their terms and with patience and, and through all of these um, other ways. Um, I'm gonna go kind of quickly through some of this, this legal stuff that's left, but please again, reach out to Equitas for any um, additional information on this. We have, we have plenty of it, um, but kind of just thinking about your pretrial motions if you're a prosecutor, um, these are just a few of them listed here. Um, and then thinking about discovery issues, what records you do have, um, you know, protecting, these are very complicated cases, right? You want to be protecting your victim as much as you can, but also a lot of information can be very relevant, um, and, and can explain a lot of what was going on with the coercion and, and the coercive behavior, um, especially in an intimate partner relationship where it can be a lot more nuanced and seemingly benign, but really is, is quite effective. Um, and then using expert witnesses is incredibly important. Um, think about um, what an expert can do to explain a lot of kind of what you just heard from Wendy and throughout this, right? A lot of what's going on, um, a juror is not going to understand. And so experts can kind of, you know, use them throughout um, your case, including case preparation, um, talk to talk to people about cases, Um and trial testimony, but importantly at trial, experts should only be used to educate the jury, not to opine on the particulars of any of any case. Um, it can provide that background information that really will help um, will really help the jury understand these dynamics that we've been talking about today. Um, and and experts can be a lot of different people, right? I know um, people a lot of times just assume they're, they're victim service professionals or, or scholars or professors or medical professionals, doctors, but really experienced law enforcement and advocates can be incredibly helpful too, to explain the terminology, explain what they know about the life um, and explain, you know, kind of give that background so that then a jury has that color and has that kind of thought process um, when they're listening to testimony. Um, and then forfeiture by wrongdoing. We do have a lot of information on this, but it's certainly something um, to be thinking about in your cases. Um, you know, the same methods of coercion that traffickers use to, um, to you know, get victims to, to work for them in their operation, they use to get victims to not testify, right, or to make them unavailable. So um, at the very most basic, basically, a defendant forfeits their right to confront witnesses against them if that unavailability is because of their wrongdoing. Um, it's been common law since 1666. It's been law in the United States for a very long time, since 1878. Um, and just kind of, you know, to think about it, it's codified in most states and it hasn't been rejected in any. Um, and some very kind of interesting uh, legal uh cases are happening on this. So we're happy to share and help you with your jurisdiction if you have questions on this, but just something to keep in mind, you know, too, basically it's the victims unavailable, the defendant, uh, due to the defendant's wrongdoing, and he intended the victim to be unavailable. Um, and that means you, you are able to admit the victim's statements and something to kind of really think about in, uh, these tra trafficking cases, especially the intimate partner trafficking cases is that a lot of that, um, uh, coercion to not testify can look very similar to that love. If you love me, you're not going to testify. If you care about our family, you won't testify. Um, and so to kind of keep that in mind, it's not just threats. Um, these are some of the additional resources. And again, this will be provided to you so you can take a look at these. Um, but really kind of as we move forward, you know, I really hope that you, we really hope that you'll be able to start recognizing that intersection between the offender tactics in intimate partner violence and in human trafficking. Um, we really hope that you will uh, support survivor-led organizations as opportunities for peer support. Um, it's really important, as, as Wendy has said, to have people who, who kind of understand and can give that hope and, and you can feel um, you know, possibly comfortable with as that bridge to kind of disclosure. Um, and then providing survivors with meaningful access to exit ramps from intimate partner trafficking. And so a lot of that includes really kind of taking a look at, um, you know, connecting people with those meaningful services. And also, uh, you know, as a prosecutor kind of thinking about, you know, can we implement no arrest policies can, for prostitution? 
Um, can we take a look at, at prior convictions and can we think about ways that we can really try to take away and remove some of those barriers to maximize those exit ramps? Um, so this is, this is Wendy's information. Um, thank you so much, Wendy, for being here today. Um, I'm, I know everybody really appreciated it. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we end? I want to say, you know, thank you. I mean, I, I see that there's a lot of people on here and I think I used to, I think one of the controls that Greg had for us was nobody in the world cares about you. Nobody in the world is going to care about, you know, prostitutes or whatever. And just seeing how many people are on here today listening, well, there are people that care. There are people willing to help. And so, um, yeah, so thank you everyone. Um, and, and thank you, Wendy, and, and my contact information is here as well, and you'll get a copy of this. And just um, to let you guys know, also, um, we do have office hours at Equitas, um, and so please feel free to join those if you can. Um, I did see, I think that there was one question in the chat that, um, unfortunately, I don't think we have time to get to, but again, please feel free to reach out with any questions to myself, um, and, and we can we can talk about those further. So thank you everybody so much for, for being here today.